to uh, call the uh, joint meeting for the Rules and Open Government Committee and Committee of the Whole to order. And Tony, can we have a roll call, please? Arenas? Arenas? Cohen? Here. Davis? Here. Morales? Here. Jones? Present. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start out with the agenda for Tuesday, December 6th. And like usual, we're going to start out on pages four and five. And please make a note that is a 11 o'clock start time for that meeting. <laughs> pages six and seven. Pages eight and nine. Pages 10 and 11. Pages 12 and 13. Pages 14 and 15 and Kip, um, I know we talked about um, having the two items that were deferred from yesterday, 8.4 and 8.5, to be heard right after consent. So uh, whoever the maker of the motion is, could you give that some consideration? Okay, so pages 14, 15, 16, and 17. Eighteen and nineteen. And please make note that item eight point two is not to be heard before six PM. Pages twenty and twenty one. And there's also an ad sheet on this agenda. Uh, so we'll now go to public comments. And Tony, do we have any members of the public that would like to speak? Mr. Beekman? Hi. Mayor uh, Beekman here. Uh, on December 6th, consent calendar, there are items of yearly federal funding of programs of local law enforcement and continuing city government projects of more surveillance, data collection, and broadband tech. With the current war of much U.S. influence going on in the Ukraine at this time, along with the federal help to the to the more honest to the honest local law enforcement concerns of 2021 and 22, are we at a time to want to again begin the peaceful steps to leave the era of 9/11 and the overall concepts of war? And from this, do we want to openly work to continue more on to more honestly address the concepts of our reimagined future at the local, national, and international level? as it is with these concepts that we can begin to more openly better question what may be the actual needs and demands of current law enforcement, its surveillance technology, and its data collection within local San Jose and Bay Area neighborhoods. We simply need to be more clear with each other in San Jose that smart streetlights, new broadband, and 5G can simply offer much additional surveillance technology and data collection in the future of local San Jose neighborhoods. This simply should make the questions of continuously asking for more and more AOPRs, shot spotter eavesdropper tech, and other surveillance tech for local neighborhoods as highly susceptible and a lot unneeded. And from this to again offer, Berkeley local government and its everyday community have proven that together we can work towards continual adjustments of better civil protections and open public policies and good accountability practices within all of the new law enforcement surveillance and commercial data collection tech that is currently being placed in our local communities at this time. Our future should be a shared process towards a future of peace, open democracy, and better reasoning, where open community discussion and participation with local government decision making is subject matter that should not have to be feared. Thanks a lot. Sure. Hi, can we speak on any of the agenda items right now or we wait till that agenda item comes up? This is um, agenda items that are on the December 6th council agenda. If you wanna talk about other items that aren't on the December 6th agenda, this is not that time. Okay, I'll wait till then. 
Okay, thanks. Back to the conference committee. Um, thank you. Uh, before we um, entertain a motion, got to ask the city manager's office, has this agenda been properly low balanced? It's going to be a very full meeting. <laughs> <laughs> So in other words, it's been loaded and not balanced. So. Well said, Vice Mayor. Thank you. It's probably as well as yesterday's was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I, have a, I have a question though. Just so this is eight point three and eight point four are already the items that were that were delayed from last week, right? So they're on here. So you should we put a when you said to make them after consent? Usually when we have these eleven a.m. starts, we have ceremonial, and by the time we get then we take the lunch break. So should we maybe set time certain one o'clock or something or well, one option would be to yes, and one option would be to do the ceremonials at one thirty. Oh, that's, that's right. What you've been doing. So, if you, um, if and since we wouldn't, uh, in discussion with the vice mayor, we wouldn't be taking a break until twelve thirty for lunch, where well, that gives you a ninety minute chunk to work through consent, and then immediately after consent, try to get through through those two items in ninety minutes, okay. or at least get a good start on them. Yeah, we want to have a formal lunch break time so the mayor doesn't screw that up like <laughs> I did previous meeting. There you go. All right. Um, yeah, I see um, Council Member Perales. Get your hand raised. Yeah, I was just going to take ownership for poor judgment um, on the length of the time uh, that the meeting would take yesterday, um, and moving it to one thirty. So I'm, I'm glad you're back and and able to keep us in line there because I I I, uh, I messed that one up. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, in, in all transparency, Councilmember Perales, I did bring up yesterday that I was not at that rules meeting. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll um, we'll see any other hands raised. I'll entertain a motion. <laughs> I move approval of the December sixth meeting uh, with an ad sheet with the ad sheet and putting eight point three and eight point four after consent and with a defined lunch break of twelve thirty to one thirty. Your second? Second. second. All, right. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, Tony? Arenas? Yes. Owen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Rollins? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, next is uh, the agenda for Tuesday, December 13th. And like always, we're going to start out on pages four and five, six and seven, eight and nine, 10 and 11, 12 and 13, Fourteen and fifteen, sixteen and seventeen, eighteen and nineteen, twenty and twenty one, twenty two. And 23, I'm not sure when this is going to end. <laughs> 24 and 25, 26 and 27, 28 and 29, 30. And 31, 32, 33, 34, and 35. Tony, I don't know if you have off the top of your head what the record is for the longest agenda. Yeah, but I can't even list it. I can't even list it. <laughs> 
All right, well, we'll go to public comments. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I think this may be the last agenda for kind of a lot of council and the mayor. Uh, if it is, just good luck to ourselves on such a long agenda. Um, I, there's an item on, um, it's been a good eight years, thanks. Uh, I've been defining, I've been better understanding what eight years means in election terms. Thank you for that. Um, there's items about renewable energy contracts. Uh, a good luck in how I think the Bay Area has, has done an awesome job in kind of separating ourselves from the future of uh, what exactly is the fossil fuel industry and, and, and dirty fuels compared with renewable energies and how to really separate and compartment compartmental, I can't say the word, but separate the two concepts uh, very well of renewables and, and, and fossil fuel energy. Uh, in Southern California, I think they have a bit more difficult time with that. Uh, so thank you for the, what you're doing. I think it's an awesome example for everyone. Uh, with um, there, There's an item about uh, law enforcement oversight. That's going to be interesting to hear. Uh, good luck on how uh, to address that issue. Uh, it involves lawyers, so good luck. And finally, 8.2 is an item about electronic billboards on city-owned property status report. Um, I think it's a time for me to try to make clear with new people coming in that I think you did not know how to speak very well to the concepts of what exactly is data collection of the electronic billboards and where that data collection ends up going. I really hope we just, as a new group comes in of, of elected officials that we make real honest attempts to more honestly talk about data collection practices and want to try to make those efforts to, to always want to talk better and better about open technology practices. Good luck on those efforts. Thanks. Paul Soto. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, first of all, I'd, uh, I'm asking the Vice Mayor if he could please do that again. That was far too quick to, even, to, to catch anything. So number one, I'm formally requesting that you do that again because that was way too fast. That's number one. Number two is that the consent calendar is being stacked with, with items that you guys just get to this point where you get real giddy and you think that policy is a joke. You think that stacking these, these agendas is a joke, but yet when those policies are actually implemented and the inadequacies and the incompetence of this council is reflected in the failures of those policies, then it's not a joke no more. Then all of a sudden those smiles off on your faces are stripped from them. And then you come in here with your folks a uh, sympathy and empathy and act like you care about what's going on in this city. But while you're here right now, you're joking and you're laughing because you think this is a joke. You think that that agenda being stacked the way that it is, is a joke. That's not a joke. That's a crime. That's what that is. That is a crime against the humanity and the dignity of the citizens of the city. Because you were stacking it and you were not allowing any kind of conversation around issues that had no business being on that consent calendar have absolutely no business. And you still haven't passed a law or a resolution that legally dis disallows the citizens from asking to have items pulled from that agenda. You still haven't formed no resolution with regard to that. So I'm making those requests. I'd like you to do that again. So as a citizen, I can see what's on there. And the fact that you make a mockery of these policies when you start laughing and joking, but yet when it's instituted, you ain't laughing. Back to the committee. Thank you. Um, I will now go to my council colleagues for input or motion. Move approval. Second. All right. It moves and seconded. I don't see any hands raised. Tony. Arenas. Yes. Owen. Aye. Davis. Yes. Morales. Yes. Jones. Aye. Okay, on to the consent calendar. Uh, 
open it up for public comments. Mayor Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, I wanted to speak to the public record and uh, the additions to a couple of work plan committee work plan items. Uh, compartmentalized, that's what I was trying to say. I'm still not saying it very well, but that's something what I wanted to say before. Um, about the public record things, uh, there's, a, there's a letter from Verizon. Uh, I think it's about the placement of, of certain uh, broadband uh, things in, in a local neighborhood. You haven't been doing that for a while and you just did that again. Thank you. Boy, I, I didn't catch that and I haven't noted that recently. I, I, it was a great service you were providing by doing that and it was a good form of, of trying to be accountable. Thank you, and, and good luck into the new administration in, in working on those sort of things, continuing those sort of good efforts. Thanks. I hope you can continue that. And with the, um, the additions to, uh, I think it's uh, neighborhood services and uh, smart cities, with the smart cities, it's digital, uh, bridging the digital divide, digital issues, digital equity, and um, you know, like what I tried to say in the previous item, you know, and, and this item, we have an important cause to really, uh, we have to just be on top of things about how we can always want to improve ourselves about how to talk about our, our, our technology for our community. And I think that would be just so helpful, you know, that it's the small things that we do that to improve ourselves that that uh, add up over time and that prove that we're, we're building uh, that better future, you know, and, and working hand in hand with digital tech, bridging the digital divide with open public policies. That's the community harmony things that I think, uh, I hope we really want to work for. And, uh, and with the neighborhood services things, that's um, children and youth programs. Uh, good luck with that. It's been a really good effort uh, by, by staff. And uh, yeah, just uh, that we're addressing that. Chair. Oh, hi. Do, do we comment now on any items on the B part of the consent calendar or do we yes. wait? This okay. Is... So I have a comment on uh, B10 regarding council vacancies. Can I start my clock back to two? I'm sorry. I won't go back fully to two. Okay, good enough. But... So yeah, so on, on number 10 on the council vacancies, you know, when we're looking at setting the agenda for that, I would like to say that I live in District 3 and I support the elections, special elections for 10 for Districts 8 and 10. One reason is because I imagine that if it were District 3 and 5 that were vacant, the people in those districts would also want special elections. And it wouldn't be about cost and it wouldn't be about turnout. It would be about what's fair to those voters. People saw redistricting around this time last year. The same groups who are opposing special elections now are the same groups who tried to take advantage of the process and move a District 5 City Council candidate from Warner Heights over to District 8. Fortunately, the people in that small neighborhood recognized what was happening and spoke out against it. These groups are not the people who should be handpicking our new council members. We also saw what happened in October with three LA council members and the president of the Labor Federation. Unfortunately, the power given to council members, along with their agendas and political aspirations, can cause them to lose touch with the concepts of democracy and the people they are supposed to represent. For six of the past vacancies, we have held special elections. Most times the council seat was left vacant during the election. It's not only one council seat this time, but two seats that account for 18% of the council vote. Yes, elections get more costly as we are making voting more accessible and improve voter rights, but these new election laws are not meant as a tool to keep people from having elections. I urge you to let the people choose their representatives. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, once again, I, I see what's going on because I've, I'm coming from an informed perspective. I've spent over five years uh, sitting with this council and listening to your lies and your chicanery. And uh, it's really easy to spot because I've spent my life around sociopaths. And I know a sociopath when I, when I hear one and see one. That's why I was able to stay out of games while in, uh, in the prison system. And so 
<clears throat> one of the characteristics is that they have this very cavalier and nonchalant uh, uh, attitude towards human suffering. And human suffering, like I said, it isn't, it isn't in the prison camps. It isn't even in the jails. This, the, the human suffering starts in the policies. And like I said, by men that wear collared shirts and have clean cut fingernails and they speak in soft tones because they don't have to shout because they're committing their crimes against humanity in these consent calendars. When you deprive the people of the, of the very basic principles of democracy. Okay, so with respect to the, the, this consent calendar and, and whether or not it's, why is it even a question as to whether or not the people have the right to choose their leaders. That is, that is not, a, that is not a, a privilege that you should even consider affording to yourself. That shouldn't even be a consideration. You sh every single one of you should demand that it goes straight back to the voters. But you see, you, when you had your aspirations for going off to some other office, you didn't afford the, the, that, you didn't even consider that because of your own political ambitions. You didn't consider the people that they would be scrambling for leaders and representation. These are the crimes that I'm talking about against humanity by which you need to be held to account. Call in user one. Yes, hi, Martha O'Connell, regional manager for GSMOL, representing mobile home park residents. I have submitted a letter to mayor and council supporting the idea of an election. The people in the mobile home park communities, the residents, are a very specific constituency, and we face very serious issues coming up. There are two parks in, two, two parks in D10 and four parks in D8, and these people should have the right to elect their representatives and not have them handpicked. I'd also like to make a comment about the analysis of how much this election is going to cost. I was told something late last night that I have not yet had a chance to investigate, but I have been advised that the person from the county who gave astronomical figures for how much these elections are going to cost was a supporter of the unsuccessful candidate for mayor and, in fact, was at this candidate's election night watch party. So I don't know if that is true. I found out late last night, I haven't done an independent investigation, but if it is, I think we really need to take a look at the estimate for the cost of these elections, because if it is true, I would suspect a bias. So I share Councilperson Cohen idea. I hope we have robust discussion of this. I hope you have not made up your minds, and I hope that you let the people choose their representatives. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Um, I will entertain a motion for the consent calendar. Move approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. And I don't see any hands raised. Um, Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Rollins? Yes. Jones? Aye. Okay, the next item is accelerating digital equity by deploying high-speed fiber to all households at no cost to taxpayers. Uh, we'll go to the public first. Public comments. Uh, Blair Beekman. Hi, right, to comment a bit differently on this item. Um, I guess to compliment the mayor for his eight years of work on this issue, uh, I was in a conversation about the subject the other day, and it occurred to me that uh, Mayor Licardo worked really hard for digital issues and digital equity issues to be a, a choice and choices of a local community. And he worked hard in those efforts. And I, I wanted to be, you know, around the concepts of how to bring open accountable practices when local communities work on these sort of projects. But the fact that he made it uh, the efforts of an individual community to work on such things uh, instead of the state level or federal level, it was an interesting choice of the mayor. And I think it's been a really interesting process for us that's given us more choices and 
and, and good choices of flexibility, how to work on issues that uh, I think has been pretty interesting. I'm not explaining this possibly as well as I could, but uh, that's certainly what we've gone through in the past uh, eight years with the mayor and good luck how to be considering those things still that I think uh, it doesn't uh, offer selfishness actually. <laughs> it offers some interesting good practice I, I think that uh, may be needed for the local level in their decision making about their broadband practices. Uh, but, you know, that's just my feelings. I guess it isn't everything, but uh, just thanks for your time and, and what has been a, a interesting eight years. Uh, thanks. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Let's talk about equity. Yeah, let's talk about that. And let's talk about uh, the contradiction in your title. Digital equity for all. That's a that's this is a this is a misnomer. It is it is a contradiction in terms. You see, lawyers are the ones that write these up. You know, they go they go through uh, the city attorney's office. So there are a bunch of white lawyers that know absolutely nothing about what it is to live in a barrio, absolutely nothing, or the generational deprivations of resources in these barrios. They know absolutely nothing. Okay, so when they're writing, it's a mock. Writing digital equity for all is a mocking term because what they're doing is that your attorneys, when they're writing this script and they're putting out the text, they're mocking these neighborhoods and they're, they're perverting what equity actually truly means. There is no equity for all. That's impossible. It's an oxymoron. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is that I don't want to hear for all. I'm not concerned about for all. I'm concerned about my community that has continually been deprived of resources that we actually had coming and that we were deprived in violation of the Fifth Amendment and the 14th Amendment of equal protection under the law and due process. So under those two premises, what I want is equity for certain zip codes and those zip codes starting number one are the zip codes that suffered the most COVID uh, infections and deaths. We'll start there and use that as a start point and then we'll just move on per zip code because what it will do is it'll leave uh, the West Side, Cambrian and Willow Glen, it'll leave them last where they belong. Back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, we have our early consideration forum on this item. Um, Kip, did you want to speak to it? Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Yes, we have an early consideration form and basically uh, two versions. One is a greenlit version, which would be a light touch request for information where we would gather the uh, interest in this kind of proposal and do a, a quick evaluation of that. The second yellow uh, light version is actually doing the in-depth full evaluation and moving forward to procurement or negotiations. Uh, it's yellow lit because that would require more resources than we have available at the time to do this uh, without reprioritizing other work. Thank you. So our two um, possible decisions are um, light touch or the more in-depth touch. Correct. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to defer to uh, my council colleagues to provide the direction. So Council Member Cohen. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to ask this question. We have a lot of memos on this and a lot of, I mean, I don't know, some of them take more and less time. I'm concerned about sort of ending the year with loading up staff with things that may not be, you know, may seem a little bit peripheral to what our focuses are. Uh, I don't know, Rob, you want to say something about this? I, you know, I think we think this is a good idea. I know that you do too. I just want to know what you think the next step should be and what the, you know, what, what, increments we should take and when. Uh, thank you. Um, Rob Lloyd, Deputy City Manager. Uh, Councilmember Cohen, I, I think the uh, option one does present uh, a good um, first take at things. We, we could then learn and then see what the options are and hear from the new council where priorities are and then give you a, kind of a, a better path with that one. But both options are, are possible and we wanted to line that out per the memo. Did I answer your question? Yes, correctly? you did. I, I mean, I'm happy to make a motion to uh, move the memo with the option one to sort of pursue and look at options and then come back for further discussion about how that fits in with our priorities and budget going forward. 
and, and we can factor that in also into a committee work plan just to make sure we return on that yeah. one and, and see where we go with it. Okay. So that, that'll be my motion. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. I don't see any other hands raised. So, um, Tony? Arenas? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Carlos? Yes. Jones? Aye. All right, next item is roles in the criminal justice system. And I'll go to public comments first. No hands raised right now. All right, um, so I'm gonna bring it uh, back. Paul Soto oh. just went up. Uh, yeah, thank you for catching that, Tony. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. This is where uh, I have probably the most expertise especially considering that certain council members keep trying to call probation to put me back in there, which ain't gonna happen, just so that you know. Uh, you know, I got some people back in my plate too, uh, in the county, so uh, anyways, you are stepping into an arena where you don't belong. This is a county issue. Let the county do their job. And here's why. Juvenile Hall has no girls in there anymore. None, zero, okay? And they have, at last count, which was, I don't know, maybe six weeks ago, 12 boys. Okay, that wasn't the case when I was there. Okay, there was a couple of hundred of us in juvenile hall back in the 1980s. Okay, so this is, you guys are stepping into an arena where you really just, you know, just, just step back, man. Just step back. Obviously, they're handling their business. Okay, you're just stepping into the Serena. Okay, so let them continue to do what they got to do. Okay, because San Jose was actually responsible for the proliferation of juveniles being in custody and creating California Youth Authority. It was this county because this county represented the most admittees, the most inmates in both the California Youth Authority and the conviction rate in the entire uh, California Department of Corrections prison system, this county right here. So, and, and the city of San Jose was the one that sent the most people to, uh, to jail out of any of the cities in this county. So, you know, just step back and let the experts do what, what it is that they got to do. And because none of you are, absolutely not. We got it handled. Thank you very much. Robert Brownstein. Good afternoon. I'd like to speak uh, in support of this proposal from uh, the chairperson of the Rules Committee, uh, Council Member Jones. These issues are truly complex, um, complex in terms of trying to figure out what to do and extremely complex in terms of trying to figure out how to do it. They involve multiple levels of government, not just the city, the DA, the county, but also state government. Uh, they may involve constitutional issues. Um, sometimes it may be a good political strategy to pretend that complex issues are simple, but that's rarely a good strategy for governing. And I'm pleased to see in this memo a concern about a strategy for governing that would in fact improve the safety of the people in San Jose, if not the people throughout the county. Um, and I think this would be a, a good step forward. Thank you very much. Back to the committee. Thank you, um, Gip. There's an early consideration form for this item as well. Correct. There's an early consideration form. It basically has two recommendations or two parts of the recommendation. One is a, a greenlit recommendation, which would be working collaboratively with the various and sundry components of the county to uh, have a working group look at each and uh, one of these issues. The yellow lit version is essentially the same version, but if the county isn't able to make the time or the parties aren't able to come to the table, we would not recommend proceeding because of the necessity of doing this collaboratively. And we have a assistant chief and XO from the police department here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank, thank you, Kip. Uh, I think it's a, a foregone conclusion that if we don't get cooperation from the county, then we're very limited in terms of what we can do to move this forward. But uh, Assistant Chief, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. 
Well, yes, Vice Mayor, uh, I, I would agree. It's hard to have a, dis a one-way discussion, um, but I think the county, I mean, my, my sense is that they would be willing to have these discussions uh, as they were willing to meet with us in September. And, and really, this is, this is sort of a fact-finding uh, mission by all of us to help the policymakers yourselves come to the right conclusions. No, thank you, because um, the real purpose of this, uh, this memo, and, and Assistant Chief, thank you for working with me to, to formulate it is to, as a follow-up from the joint meeting that we had with the county. And out, out of that meeting, there's, there was a, a feeling of, you know, wanting to continue to work together and collaborate, but, you know, I, I wanted to see a little something a little bit more concrete in terms of, of next steps. So that's what this memo represents. So thank you for working with me on it. Um, I don't see any hands raised. I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Tony? Sorry, Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Rawls? Rawls? Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay, next is San Jose's elected official political fundraising independent expenditure involvement ordinance. And we will go to the public first. Giving them a chance to raise their hands. And I have no hands up. Oh, Robert Brownstein. Thank you. Um, and thank you for allowing me uh, a second bite of the apple uh, to speak again. Uh, I'd like to speak in support of the uh, memo from uh, council member Esparza. Uh, a while back, I spent two years as a member of the city Sunshine Task Force. And since then, I've continued to have an interest in and a commitment to transparency and high standards of ethics in San Jose's government. The flaws in the status quo, I think, are obvious. If elected officials can create and lead independent expenditure committees, that creates both the possibility of a pay-to-play arrangement and certainly creates the appearance of possible pay-to-play arrangements. In addition, I see absolutely no downside to moving forward in the direction that Council Member Esparza suggests. What harm could possibly result from preventing elect elected officials from skirting campaign limits and campaign disclosure requirements by directing independent expenditures. Um, as far as I can tell, there, is, there are only positive outcomes from this suggestion uh, that is being proposed uh, and no downsides. It, I believe, presents good values and good sense. Thank you for listening. Oscar Castro. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. My name is Waskar Castro uh, with Working Partnerships. Um, would like to voice our strong support for the memo put forth by Councilmember Esparza uh, and really appreciate the intent of this memo, which is to be proactive uh, in keeping separate um, elected officials and their abilities to govern uh, and the um, heavy influence of independent expenditures. Um, over the past couple of years, there has been um, blurred lines of the interaction between um, elected officials, uh, potential influence and in relation to folks um, with independent expenditures um, and how that has made its way into effects of city business. While we recognize that there may be, there may have not been improprieties, having the ability to allow um, special interest to not have um, an overt amount of influence on our um, gut local ability to govern is of utmost importance. So again, we appreciate the intent and we look forward to the opportunity of moving forward uh, and allowing our public servants to serve the public and not um, be overly encumbered to our special interests. Thank you very much. Tara McDermott. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah McDermott, and I'm the political director of Unite Here Local 19. 
On behalf of our members, I want to thank Council Member Esparza for her memo and express our strong support for ensuring we have a transparent democracy in San Jose. We must be proactive in making sure we create a clear separation between elected officials, their staff, and independent expenditures. Over the past couple of years, we have seen several instances where special interests have had too much influence through contributing to IEs being uh, either controlled or guided by city officials. The boundaries between campaigning and public service must be clearly defined. And we urge this committee to move forward with modifications to make sure we have a just democracy with transparency and, gover uh, and uh, around governance and special interests. Thank you. Jose Luis Pavon. Hello, um, good afternoon. My name is Jose Luis Pavon and I'm a political organizer with SEIU USWW. Uh, we represent janitors, security officers, and airport workers and allied entertainment workers in the city of San Jose and throughout the South Bay um, and statewide. Um, we would like to thank uh, Council Member Maya Esparza for putting forward uh, this proposal, and we enthusiastically support um, uh, Maya Esparza's uh, uh, proposal. Um, we, For us, it is absolutely urgent um, to make sure that there are checks and balances in place um, to make sure that we have an equitable democracy at a local level um, to ensure transparency. And, and uh, I, would, I would go further to say that uh, to name some of these special interests that, that uh, major corporations, um, the, the tech lobby, the real estate lobby, um, among others, should not have an imbalanced, disproportionate amount of power and say over the governance of the city of San Jose. So it, it's not just that um, politicians may be skirting uh, uh, the law to create independent expenditures, it's powerful corporate interests that are, are taking over the city and we need to maintain a balanced democracy. Thank you so much. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I need to remind everybody that one of the greatest in, in history will bear this out. History will vindicate what I'm about to say. The non-disclosure agreement that was signed by three signatories, okay, our mayor, our current mayor, D3 representative, and five representatives, and their staff members, which one of them is Omar Torres signed a non-disclosure agreement with Google one year before they voted. Now, look up in the, uh, in the penal code under 637. This is a crime, it's called bribery. And what bribery means is that you accept something in exchange for something else, but you have a power that was given to you that was necessarily with what it is that you're doing or exercising, meaning that those representatives had no business inside of a room signing a non-disclosure agreement with Google one year before they voted on the Google land deal. Number two is that they, what they did is they didn't list land to Google, which they absolutely, had they had the fiduciary accountability and responsibility to the people that they represented, they would have. However, because it was a non-disclosure agreement and, and kept secret, they didn't feel that fiduciary responsibility because it was never going to be exposed to the people, which means they took that privilege, assumed that privilege, went boom, made a vote, and then told the, they're telling the people, telling the people, saying, oh, trust us, we're doing this in your best interest. That's a lie. That is a lie. Right there is for the city. Back to the committee. Hi, thank you. Um, I know that Council Member Esparza is here. I mean, on Zoom. So, uh, Council Member Esparza, go ahead. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I. Uh, 
I wanted to say a few words about this memo. Um, first of all, I, whoops, we don't want that. <laughs> Having some technical challenges. Um, firstly, you know, I specifically waited until after the election to bring this memo forward. I, it is not intended to be um, about any one election or person. It, it really has to do with the tradition at the city. The city of San Jose has been a leader in transparency and local government, most notably with Mayor Chuck Reed's sunshine reforms in 2006. And this memo seeks to continue that tradition by aligning our municipal code so that it conforms with state law. Um, furthermore, it builds upon the advice given to the city from the FPPC identifying really what is essentially a good governance loophole um, and builds on the discussions of the Board of Fair Campaign um, and Political Practices, again, to align with state law. These actions raise the bar for all of us, all of the elected officials in our city. Um, and so I ask that you approve this item to uh, come to the council um, for a full consideration. Thank you. Um, looking for other hands raised, comments, motion, Council Member Davis. Thank you. I just have a question for, um, for Nora and kind of a point of order. Is this something that we need to discuss with the full council before it goes to the city attorney? And I guess that might be a question for either the vice mayor or the city manager's office. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member. Um, as I understand it, this would be uh, directing our office to return um, with the items that she's outlined in the memo. And our job would be to do that um, in a way that's most legally defensible. And if we don't think we can, to let the Council know that. Okay. Is there a... Um kind of a timeline for that is this going to be so the the reason I'm asking I'm I'm in favor of this I, but I don't know that this that the rules committee has the ability to direct you without going to council first correct my understanding is this will go to council um, but it, either way um, we can look at it and I know the board is looking at at least um, some of these issues also so we would want to coordinate with them which board? Uh, the board of Fair Campaign oh, and FPPC uh, or the our, no, our, our, our own board, Fair Campaign and and uh, political practices. Okay, is this something then that would come to? We would have to agendize it for council. That's my understanding. Yes. Okay, given that we only have two, I, I'm happy to make the motion and and with apologies to council member Esparza, um, given that we only have two meetings left of the year and they are pretty full. I, I'm happy to make the motion to move this forward to agendize it for early January. Second. All right, to have a motion and a second. Uh, Let me ask a question first. Um, just a, que a follow-up question for Nora. So, mm -hmm. so if, if we ask something more general, like review these potential actions and other op actions that could be taken to uh, to align a sitting council member's participation in independent expenditures with their same restrictions we have in other types of fundraising. Do we really have to go to council for that, or can can we, as you know, say let's come back with that report to council so that we can discuss what we can do before we just take a vote to ask you to <laughs> to do that? It, we can handle it that way too. If council would like a briefing. Um, essentially, um, that that's kind of that can, that's kind of that why I envisioned it is that we would mm -hmm. ask you to come back and say what's possible, what are the rules that we can do, and mm -hmm. then we would have a discussion at council as opposed to taking that interim step that wouldn't necessarily bring us any answers yet. Um, so yeah. as long as that's, I don't know if you think that's. Can you do that briefing within the next within December, or do you want to come back and 
January for the briefing. I wasn't suggesting December. I don't think yeah. they have time to okay. do it by yeah. then, <laughs> December. But. Uh, well, two things. Yeah, the, the agendas are so full. Right. January would be better for us, mm -hmm. and I'm okay. losing um, our election attorney to the city of Palo Alto. So um, I, I, we're going to need to backfill there, so I'm going to need a little more time than normal. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm happy to amend my motion then, as uh, suggested by Councilmember yeah, Cohen. I, I, I mean, I actually want it to be a little more general in the motion itself. I mean, I know that the memo has specific recommendations, but I, I wanted to also add something more general that says just to look at limitations, legality, and liability of prohibiting sitting council staff from working for or chairing IEs. So it's a more general statement as opposed to, you know, the specific remedies that are in the memo. And then also looking at whether we can amend the revolving door policy to address this, the you know, what you can do after you leave. So that, that's a more general way of, of looking at it, what, having your office look at what's possible and what's not so we can have the full answers. So can I add, add those two things as uh, amendments to the motion? Yes. Okay. Is that okay with my seconder? Council Member Reynas? Yes, ma'am. And is that okay with the city attorney? <laughs> it, it is. I, I think we would probably do both uh, the specific and the and the general, um, and uh, and also coordinate with the board. If the board is going to be making recommendations to the council on some of these things, then I think we ought to coordinate with them too. Okay, so we have a modified motion in a second, and uh, Councilmember Reynas, I see your hands raised. Um, yes, I uh, thank you. So I just wanted to thank Councilmember Esparza for this memo. Um, I'm sad that we're not going to be able to speak um, and have her be part of the discussion before. Well, neither one of us is going to be part of this discussion. Um, and I absolutely um, just want to highlight how important it is for our mayors um, to be those protectors and guides that she referenced in her memo. Um, and this, this last campaign <clears throat> election, excuse me, um, just really muddled the waters um, in a way that I don't think um, encourages democracy and um, transparency for, for our local um, electeds. And so um, thank you so much for, for putting this forward, uh, Councilman Burr-Sparza. All right, thank you. Um, don't see any other hands raised. Um, we have motion in a second. Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chair. Sorry, Tony. I, I was uh, cut off by the elevator on the last vote. Um, oh. Could you mark me as a, as a yes? Yes. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, item on the agenda is readying downtown for the next wave of growth and greater vibrancy. And we will go to public comments first. Larry Beekman. Hi, Larry Beekman here. You guys had this sort of item a few weeks ago on an agenda. I was really hopeful for it and what you guys could have been talking about, the future of uh, parking issues, cars. Uh, what do we do about the future of uh, car, individual transportation, single occupancy vehicle use versus uh, the, the future of mass transit? All those sort of good questions. And boy, I was ready. I wanted to learn from that meeting and then share that stuff down here in San Diego as they're going through some of the same things at this time, the same questions about the future of their downtown area. Um, I, you guys have made a really important start on these efforts to consider the future of cars and parking. Uh, Santa Clara, the city of Santa Clara is, is interested in this sort of work. I, I hope that we have some beginning good steps and I hope you want to make those next steps more solidified now and more open and clear in, in this sort of uh, future of downtown events. And of course, you know my feelings that uh, the future of downtown simply has to have 
uh, you know, a more, uh, to be considering the concepts of open and accountable practices for all the, the tech and data collection that's going on currently in downtown, to, to want to also offer open accountable practices that invites that's that people will say well yeah let's look into that that's cool we can go downtown i can ask my government questions they're not spying on me they're working with me you know they're not they're not working against me um it, it's learning how to have that accessible process available that i hope you really want to work on that's how we build a good future you know our, our shared good future sustainable things and uh so good luck to really trust that we can talk about technology with everyday community. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I uh, beg to differ. The government is working against you. There's been two efforts in the past 30 days to have me locked up. So yes, they are against you. And they consider certain citizens of the city enemies of the state. Uh, my council uh, person D3, District 3, gave this analogy uh, a couple of weeks ago. He stated that, um, well, at a Thanksgiving dinner, you know, you got to make room for people, you know, when they come down. And this one, this was in response. It was a very, very weak, very impotent response to my challenge that this city needs to be honest about the 400,000 people that you guys already planned to be here. You, Gary Dillabo, Eric Hayden, Jay Paul, and all the rest of them decided that 400,000 people are going to come here. You didn't, I don't, I don't remember the council. I don't know, maybe I was locked up when that council meeting happened, but I don't ever remember when that council meeting happened. Is it going to happen here? Okay, are you going to be honest about the fact that you guys already decided that that was going to happen to us and that we just got to sit down and accept that? Uh, is that going to be the thing? Um, to counter the, anal the weak analogy that was given is that when people come over for Thanksgiving, they're considered guests. Guests. And then when they're done, they leave. Is that what's going to happen here? Uh, is that what's going to happen here? Or are they going to come here, they're going to stay, and they're going to start using their money to exercise power. Power in the city where racial equity has still not been amended. The policies that created the inequities by which I have had to, and my parents and my grandparents have had to contend with for over 80 years, still needs to be accounted for. The city attorney and the city itself is still responsible for the reparations for the Chicanos. Back to the committee. Thank you. Um, Kip, I know we have an early consideration form for this item. Yes, Mr. Vice Mayor Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager, we do have an early consideration form and the recommendation from staff is that it is green lit. Um, let me explain that just a little bit. The way that it comes to a green light on this is that it takes these recommendations and puts them into the budget process in what's called an MBA, a manager's budget addendum. And what that would do is take these recommendations and evaluate uh, how much resources would be required, what the work plans would look like, and then make recommendations on what it would take to move forward. So the uh, the changes from the recommendation are that we wouldn't be returning to council in the first quarter of 2023, but that all of these would be bundled as part of the budget. And Deputy City Manager uh, Rosalind Huey, as well as uh, Chris Burton, uh, Director of Planning, and Blagi Zalalich are here to speak to this item if there are any questions. Thank you, um, Council Member Perales. I don't know if the mayor was on. I was going to defer to him. No, he's not on. Okay, sounds good. Well, appreciate the response from staff and uh, recognized uh, the timing here. Um, may not allow for that first quarter, but I, I think this gives the council next year an opportunity to have a good discussion on some things that I think will be worthwhile to plan and address as uh, we we enter the year. Um, and so I appreciate the staff recommendation and I'll move approval. All right, it's been moved and seconded. I don't see the other hands raised. So, Tony? Arenas? Arenas? Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Perales? Yes. Jones? Aye. 
Okay, next is Office to Residential Conversion Pilot Program, and we'll go to public comments first. Claire Beekman. Hi, um, I don't quite understand the depth of this item, so I will pass. I lowered my hand, uh, I'll pass. Good luck on this item. All in user one. Yeah, hi, I don't know what's going on with your technology guys, but I didn't raise my hand. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Paul Soto. They're spying on us is what they're doing, collecting our data and looking at all our little dirty little secrets. Um, with respect to this item, what I would like, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe, what I would like to see is the analysis of who do you have planned to live in these uh, spaces that you are uh, considering for conversion. I think uh, a very clear, not, not this vague, affordable, that isn't going to work anymore, man. You know, I mean, you guys use these euphemistic terms to really shy away from being accountable and responsible. But yet you want to come after me, have cops point guns at me and lock me up in, in, inside of a cage. That's where you guys think I belong. Well, at least some of these members. Uh, and and, and th that's, that's what I'm talking about, is that you guys still have not come to a point where you could just be honest with the public about the corruption that you guys are doing. I mean, you can't. You just sit there with your laughter and your smiles and your mockery and, and, and you pass policies and, and the stuff is already decided before we even come to the meeting. I mean, already, it's, you guys have already decided it. Licardo Berg borne that out. So what, what you need to do with this particular item is be honest about who you have targeted to live in there, okay? Because it's not the regular average citizen, okay? Because 46% of Santa Clara County, this is a fact, 46%, earns less than $50,000 a year, 46%. So that means when you have a median area income, which in Santa Clara County, last I checked, 132 grand, 132 grand. Okay, if it's that high, then that means you only have a very small percentage of people that are going to be able to live in these areas. What's gonna happen with that 46%, huh? Back to the committee. Thank you, um, Kip. I know there's an early consideration form on this item as well. Yes, Mr. Vice Mayor. Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. We do have an early consideration form, and this issue is an issue that's facing many cities uh, across the nation, so there's actually a lot of good work that we can draw on, and staff has recommended folding this work into the Housing Catalyst Work Plan, and therefore it would be a green light. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you, Kip. I'll move approval. All right, it's been moved and seconded. And don't see other hands raised. So, Tony? Arenas? Owen? Hi. Davis? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Jones? Hi. Thank you. Okay, last is open forum. Larry Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Catherine Hedges read you the Riot Act and is pretty disgusted with how you guys are working on downtown uh, building policies. I hope on that previous item that you really work towards real affordable housing ideas for such an item. Thank you. I've spoken often. There can be incredibly organized, well-structured, good ways, individual participatory democracy can work towards and healthily add to the concepts of a sustainable, sustainable republic. I feel individual participatory democracy can work to better reduce the harm and misunderstandings that wars between nations, along with over the, the over-policing of the local level, can often cause to the everyday people of local communities. If you have noticed, local law enforcement agencies in major California cities at this time are now seriously talking about in open public meetings about the practical good purposes of armed robots 
And that this past summer, local California law enforcement agencies have been have had an incredibly difficult time to describe how many new and current ALPRs they have. To myself, it has been an obvious sign they want to be more open and accountable to the public with their technology tools, but simply do not know how to better work in these good terms. So I was a bit offended in the initial words of Mayor Ricardo in the October ALPR public meetings in saying that we have already done enough accountability work with ALPR issues. And when at the same time, civic innovation government staff was continually trying to offer their services, that they simply feel that there was a need for more work to better understand what can be openness, accountability, community ideas and feelings on the future of SDA community technology. Mayor Licardo has been part of building the current civic innovation staff to better learn how to create a more participatory process with the everyday public and to better consider human rights, civil rights and civil protections for decision making in the technology future of San Jose. I hope these can be some of the important, most long term legacies of the current mayor and what I hope the current mayor elect would like to follow up with. Continuing good ideals and cooperation. Paul Soto. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. The Fifth Amendment provides that private property cannot be taken by the government without just compensation. Was not Spanish the language of my mother and ancestors, her private property? Did not San Jose and the Elm Rock School District teach her by force and fear that it was a shameful thing worthy of humiliation and punishment to be Mexican and to speak Spanish in school? San Jose took something from me that was mine, the language of my mother and my ancestors. Was this violent to do this to both my mother and myself? Am I not confronted daily with the reality that the United States government, County of Santa Clara and the city of San Jose deprived me of something private that I had a constitutionally protected right to possess? Is this not violence towards the tens of thousands of Chicanos who grew up not speaking Spanish? Where's my just compensation for taking something as fundamental as language from the Chicano? San Jose redlined the Mexican, stripping him of ancestral wealth. Chicanos of my generation were burglarized, robbed, using force of law and the fear of the policeman's club from wealth we normally would inherit had the Chicanos' right to private property been respected. Does not the Chicanos of my generation deserve equal protection under the law, due process, as we redress the historical injustices? San Jose stole from the Chicanos the security of stability in these uncertain times of gentrification and cultural paradigm shifts that is heavily promoted by Scott Neese, Gary Dillabo, Jay Paul, Eric Hayden, Alex Shore, and a host of others. And it is for this that this city tries to lock me up. This city put porta potties, urine and feces depositories in front of a historical landmark downtown. I spoke with Irving the owner of Hammer and Lewis. He knew nothing about that. That means the Downtown Association, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group have a lot to answer for to the Chicano community. Omar Tor Back to the committee. Thank you, Yasmeen is adjourned.